The day was so hot that women avoided wearing heels, fearing they would sink into the softened asphalt. The townspeople sought shade under trees and bus stop roofs, and enjoyed the coolness of store air conditioners. Inside one of the city's most famous notary offices, the heat was even more intense. The office had comfortable air conditioning, but the heated emotions of the participants made it feel stifling. More than ten people were gathered in a cramped room, all eager to hear a will. While waiting, the participants glanced at each other, coughing nervously and stealing anxious glances. Some of them were meeting each other for the first time, while those who were acquainted whispered quietly. Suddenly, a bulky man, blotting his forehead with a handkerchief, shouted to an elderly man in a cap sitting next to him, "What do you know about the deceased?" He was a wonderful man. My mother used to take care of him when he was a child. She was his mother's stepsister. The elderly man responded angrily, "Even though I'm a cousin of his cousin, I am still family. We met Eric a few times and had wonderful conversations." This sparked a heated argument, with everyone trying to shout over each other, listing their connections to the deceased and emphasizing their relationships. The room resembled a buzzing beehive, although the tone was more akin to dogs fighting over a bone. Just as the situation threatened to escalate into a fight, a tall gentleman in an expensive suit entered the room. His presence commanded attention, and for a moment, silence fell. "What is this outrage? What kind of commotion is going on here?" he exclaimed in a menacing voice. "I demand that everyone calm down immediately." Some people stopped talking, while others, fueled by their anger, continued to shout insults at the gathered. One lady, particularly indignant, spoke up. "No one here was around Eric when he was alive, but as soon as you find out about the will, you all appear." The man who had entered was the notary, and he interrupted the speaking lady with irritation in his voice. "Don't make me start shouting! If you all don't calm down now." I'll have to postpone the reading of the will. His stern voice and the threat of delaying the will finally had an effect. The room fell silent, although the participants still glared at each other with anger in their eyes. Almost everyone present that day gathered to hear the reading of the will of the businessman and believed deep down that they were mentioned in it. However, there was one woman who had been quietly sitting on the sidelines the whole time. She was the legal spouse of the deceased, and knew that she shouldn't expect any special bounty from him, neither in life nor after his death. In her youth, when she first met him, she still hoped to receive love and attention, but years later she regretted the marriage more than once. But once everything started gorgeously. Clear at that time got a job as an assistant secretary in the city administration. Marianne, Mrs. Kearney, the director of the orphanage where Clea had been brought up since she was three years old, helped her with this. Clea was a favorite of all, starting from nannies, ending with the director of the orphanage. Mrs. Kearney used to say every time she met her, "What a beauty you will be! I hope there will be a prince for such a princess." The girl blushed and shyly answered, "Well, Mrs. Kearney, why do I need a prince?" I will marry only for love, not for riches. Once, in one of the corridors of the administration, Clea accidentally ran into a tall, slender man. She dropped a stack of folders from her hands, which she was carrying to the archive, and the man helped to collect them. Handing over the last one, he smiled dazzlingly and said, "I'm ready to accompany such a beauty all the time, so that God forbid she doesn't stumble again." But first, I would very much like to get acquainted and ask her out on a date. My name is Eric Anderson. Clea, having no experience with men, was frightened, and picking up the folders, thanking the stranger, quickly left. And she was greatly surprised when, at the end of work, she noticed a gallant gentleman with a huge bouquet in his hands at the entrance to the city hall. You ran away so quickly. That I decided to wait and get acquainted," Eric said, and apparently seeing the frightened eyes of the girl, 
he immediately smiled and added, Let's just go for a walk then. Opposite the city hall, there is a beautiful park. Tell me about yourself. I'll tell you my soul, and you won't be afraid of me. Then I can finally invite you to the restaurant. He smiled so kindly and charmingly that Clea agreed. They took a long walk in the park, ate ice cream in a street cafe, and talked, talked, talked. Eric turned out to be an excellent conversationalist, well-read and intelligent. Clea felt at ease with him from the first minutes of communication, as if they had known each other for years. He knew so much and told interesting stories that Clea was ready to listen to him day and night. The man was twenty years older, but Clea did not feel it at all. Eric at that time was a well-known personality in the city and ran a construction company in the city. They took a long walk, after which the man accompanied Clea home and asked, Clea, will we see each other again? I absolutely hate to part with you, but you must promise that tomorrow you will allow me to meet you from work again and agree to have dinner with me. That night the girl had trouble sleeping as her thoughts were consumed by her new acquaintance. Clea, experiencing these emotions for the first time, didn't yet realize that she had fallen in love. She wished she could fast-forward time to the next evening just to meet Eric sooner. It wasn't until early morning that she was finally able to fall asleep with a happy smile on her face. From that day on, Eric started meeting her after work every day in his expensive car, causing whispers of disapproval from Clea's colleagues at work. No one could believe that a poor girl from an orphanage, who lived in a small room on the outskirts of the city with no money, was involved in a relationship with a mature, wealthy man, purely out of love. People speculated about the girl's ulterior motives, accusing her of using Eric for personal gain, but they couldn't comprehend that Clea couldn't bear to go a day without seeing Eric. She was willing to spend the entire day just listening to him, taking in his expensive perfume and feeling the touch of his hands. After a month of dating, Clea visited Eric's beautiful country house. The rooms were light, cosy and featured huge floor-to-ceiling windows. As she looked around, she couldn't help but wonder how much time it took to clean and wash all of those windows. Unfortunately, quite soon, she was able to figure it out by herself, and it happened right after they got married. A couple of weeks after their wedding, Eric embraced his young wife and said, Darling, I've been thinking, why do we need a stranger in the house? And besides, it's an unnecessary expense. So, I've let go of the housekeeper. You're young and full of energy, especially since you're not working right now. I believe you can handle everything on your own. Blinded by love for her husband, Clea didn't even consider the possibility that Eric had married her for certain purposes, except for his love for her. But the ugly truth was that he needed a young and beautiful companion by his side to elevate his status as a wealthy and family-oriented man in high society. Moreover, he knew that a girl from an orphanage wouldn't have high expectations or demands. And so it went. If before the wedding Eric showed Clea some signs of affection, like giving her flowers and gifts, after the wedding she became nothing more than a cover for his successful life, and also a housekeeper and a cook, all rolled into one. And when Clea finally mustered the courage to mention this, a year into their marriage, Eric coldly dismissed her, saying, "'What more do you want? You're living in paradise, a beautiful house, a renowned husband, and all the clothes you could dream of. If you're not satisfied, feel free to leave with your belongings. I've been married four times, and finding a fifth wife won't be a problem.' That night, Eric was drunk and clear, cried all night, but convinced herself that it was the alcohol talking." She desperately wanted to believe that everything would be okay between her and Eric. There were moments when he was tender and gentle. There were evenings when he would come home from work and say, Darling, tonight we won't be having dinner at home. Put on your best outfit. Let's go to our favorite restaurant. 
On those nights, they would look at each other affectionately, just like before. They would drink champagne and dance to beautiful slow tunes. In those moments, Clea was willing to put up with her husband's occasional bad moods, blaming them on his demanding job. During the first years of their marriage, Clea held on to hope that she would give her husband a child and complete their family. But when Eric suddenly confessed, I'm sorry, dear, but we can't have children. Well, I can't. But it's okay, right? He looked guiltily as he spoke, his gaze fixed on the pale clear. What's wrong, baby? We're good together. The house is beautiful, and we can travel freely, wherever and whenever we want. And children, they bring worries, diapers and sleepless nights. The important thing is that we have each other. Her husband seemed so affectionate and sincere that Clea clung eagerly to his chest, deciding that there was no reason to upset. Some people live without children. Eventually, they could adopt a child from an orphanage. However, after a couple of years, Eric changed so much that having a child became impossible. After a few years, they lived like strangers under the same roof. Clea had nowhere to go because, in the first year of marriage, Eric convinced her to sell the apartment she got from the state as an orphan and to invest the money in his business. However, the hubby was satisfied with everything. The house was clean, the meal was cooked, and there was a beautiful young wife ready to look after him for a roof over her head. Relations between them, as between a man and a woman, came to naught. Eric would often come home from work, go straight to his study, pour himself multiple large glasses of whiskey, and fall asleep at the table. Colleagues and acquaintances noticed that Eric had been giving up a lot lately, attributing it to work stress and long hours. Only Clea, his loyal wife, knew that his mood swings, irregular heartbeat, and other health issues were caused by his alcohol addiction. However, whenever she tearfully pleaded with him to stop drinking, Eric would yell at her, belittling her and reminding her of her dependence on him. "'What are you trying to tell me, you beggar? Be happy that I have not divorced you yet. Shut up and know your place. You're the wife of an honourable man in town. Without me, you're nothing.' Eric's mother shared the same opinion. Coming periodically to visit her son, instead of greetings she began to sling mud at her daughter-in-law right from the doorstep. Eric, why did you take this beggar on your back? She used to say to her son, artistically wiping a non-existent tear from her cheek. How can a person who has never had a house of his own creation comfort? She's completely tasteless. In clothes, in food, in the interior. You'd better marry my friend's daughter. She has a good education and comes from an honourable family of professors. And by the way, she is still single. Clea endured all of this silently, pretending not to notice her mother-in-law's insults. But she did not have a job. Her husband insisted, and she had no friends and relatives either, so she had to listen to all these unflattering speeches in her address. This continued until Eric's death. Even at the notary's office, the grumpy mother-in-law continued to look at Clea as an enemy. Eric's mother was exactly that loud lady who clarified the degree of kinship among those present. Clea had no desire to bring up the past, and she certainly wasn't going to discuss her late husband with anyone. She would not have come here at all, understanding that it was unlikely that her stingy husband had left her anything. He had made a marriage contract with Clea only so that in case of his death, she would not keep her lovers on his money. Clea was deeply offended by these accusations, because she hadn't given him any reason to think that way. But he jokingly explained that all the wealthy people in his circle did the same. Clea had sincerely loved her husband when she married him. She considered him wiser because of his age, and agreed with him on everything. Clea's thoughts were interrupted by a venomous hissing sound nearby. "'Don't even hope that Eric left you anything. He must have known that you married him for his money, so he probably made sure that you only had what you came with.' 
Clea turned around and replied to her mother-in-law quietly but sharply, Mrs. Anderson, you should be ashamed. Your only son is dead, after all, and even here you are causing a scene. I don't need anything, except a place to live, and I think I can manage that by myself. At the very least, have some decency, and be quiet in memory of your son. Clea had no desire to dwell on the past, nor to speak bad of the deceased. She simply wanted it to be over quickly, so that she could never see these people again. Finally, the notary requesting silence began reading the will. The office was filled with nervous tension. The old man in the cap coughed quietly from time to time, bringing his hand to his face. The overweight man wiped droplets of sweat from his forehead every second. Eric's mother glared at her daughter-in-law with hatred, and the other people were clearly nervous. The first names on the list of heirs, of course, was Mrs. Anderson. Her son bequeathed to her his country mansion, where Clea continued to live after her husband's death. In addition, Eric left his mother all the luxury items that had accumulated in their house. There was a time when he collected expensive antique things that had considerable value. After hearing the notary, Mrs. Anderson turned to Clear and angrily whispered, "'Have you packed your things? I want even your spirit out of my house from tonight.' Clear didn't respond. She simply turned away and continued to listen to the will." Meanwhile, the notary was announcing all the new names of distant relatives, many of whom had last seen the deceased in childhood. Everyone glared angrily at the young widow, realizing that now was announced only a small piece of what the businessman possessed. It was unclear from where, but everyone already knew that the deceased man had considerable bank accounts and investments in some assets. Since the couple had no children, it was expected these items would go to clear. But to everyone's surprise, the notary announced that the wife of the deceased would receive a small house in a remote village a couple of hours' drive from the city. Clea was sitting behind everyone at a loss. She had expected various things from her stingy husband, but she had never expected this. Clea was aware of that dilapidated hovel. Shortly before his death, her husband came home drunk, upbeat, and began boasting from the doorstep. Darling, today a man lost to me in poker, and you know how I don't forgive debts. So, I was given a house in the village. From the photo, it looks like the house has been abandoned for a long time, but it's better than nothing. Clea knew that besides his alcohol addiction, her husband had another bad habit. He often played cards, and not just for fun. She could even tell when Eric was losing or winning. If he lost, he would return home angry and immediately head to the bar without even taking off his shoes. On such days, Clea would try to go to her bedroom and avoid him, knowing that only a scandal awaited her. If Eric won, he would shout from the doorstop, Wifey, I'm home, and I'm hungry as a wolf. Your man came home with spoils today. On one such day, he mentioned an abandoned house outside the city, but Clea could never have imagined that this would be all her husband would leave to her after his death. The first one to regain her composure was Eric's mother. Approaching her daughter-in-law, she hissed maliciously, "'You don't seem happy. Be grateful that Eric at least left you this. Did you think you could live happily ever after on Eric's savings? No, that's not how it works. My son wasn't a fool.' and he did the right thing. You lived like a lady for long enough. Go back to your miserable world. Clea, not wanting to hear any more, rushed out into the corridor and sat down on a bench, sobbing silently. She could hear the scandalous, overweight man discussing her. What did she expect? They marry the men who are fit to be their fathers and think they've caught the bird of happiness by the tail. Let her try to live without Eric. I bet she can't even work. Clea cried even harder. She felt bitter and offended towards her husband, with whom she had lived for over ten years, eight of which were a living hell. Eric decided that her attitude to him and her love for him was worthy only of an old ruined shack. Although he knew 
perfectly well that if anything happened, she would have nowhere to live. He was the one who had convinced her to sell her only home, and he was the one who had insisted that she quit her job. As a result, she was now left without a source of income or a roof over her head. Clea couldn't remember how long she had been sitting in the corridor of the notary's office, but after calming down a bit, she decided to forget everything as a terrible dream and try to start her life anew. First of all, she thanked herself for her foresight, because she had managed to save some money from the household money her husband had given her. It was as if she had a premonition that she needed to rely only on herself. She had been saving a little bit every time for the past five years. She used the money to rent a small one-bedroom apartment on the outskirts of the city and began searching for a job. With limited experience and education, it was difficult to find something decent. That's when she remembered the orphanage. She went there with hope, and she was never disappointed. Over the years, the orphanage had undergone many changes. The premises were modernly renovated, and everything was clean and cosy. Many employees remained the same, and at first didn't recognize the stately well-groomed woman who was once their ward. Clea found the director in her office. Mrs. Kearney was busy with something, scrutinizing the text on the computer. The principal took off her glasses and immediately exclaimed happily, Oh, my Clea has arrived. I didn't expect you. I thought maybe she had children and couldn't visit us. Come in, sit down. Tell me, how are you doing? How many children you have? And how's your husband? I heard you married well. You look just like in a picture. Clea shared her entire story and in the end cried. Mrs. Kearney stroked Clea's head, just like she did in her childhood, and whispered, You're my girl. Why were you punished like this? It's true what they say. Even in a golden cage, there is bitterness. Then she suddenly said to Clea, You know what, Clea? Come and work for us. For now, you can work as a nanny in the junior group, and then I'll give you a recommendation to study to become a teacher. You can also live here. We have a staff room. You can save everything, even though the salary is small. And so, Clea started working the next day. The woman was delighted to take care of the children. The kids were all under three years old, and from the very first moment they loved Clea as if she were their own mother. Yielding to Mrs. Kearney's persuasions, Clea moved to the orphanage. She was given a beautiful room on the second floor of the building, with fresh repairs and new furniture. The room had everything necessary, although there was nothing superfluous. A spacious closet with a mirror, a bed, a couple of chairs, a table, and a new TV mounted on the wall were all that the room contained. But Clea didn't need much more than that. It was certainly not the luxurious chamber of her former husband, but a quiet and peaceful place, where Clea could be alone with her thoughts. However, she tried to spend as much time as possible at work, and only returned to her room at night. The woman finally began to distance herself from the events of the past, and less frequently reminisced about her previous life. Several times she thought about the inherited house in the middle of nowhere, and considered giving up such a meagre inheritance. But luckily she had mentioned it to Mrs. Kearney, and the wise and experienced woman immediately exclaimed, "'What are you thinking, Clea? It's still a piece of real estate. You should go and see for yourself what kind of house it is. Maybe it's not as bad as you think. You can always sell it if you don't want to live there. Don't refuse it. Tomorrow, girl, you have the day off. Go and see what you've inherited.' and then decide what to do with it. The next morning, Clea took the first bus to the countryside. She had not expected the place, only two hours away from the city, to be so abandoned. The road was in such a terrible condition that it seemed impossible for cars to drive on them. Most of the houses in that village were abandoned. Only ten houses appeared to be inhabited, but Clea didn't see any residents around. The house turned out to be the second from the end of the village, and it looked very shabby and unpleasant. The run-down fence barely enclosed the grounds any more, and it seemed like the whole fence would fall straight to the ground 
as soon as she opened the gate. Surprisingly, that didn't happen. Timidly, Clea entered the property and began to examine the house, although it was difficult to call it a house. The faded, greying structure seemed like it could collapse at any moment, and the windows were crisscrossed with shapeless wood, with some of the glass broken. Above the entrance was a gaping dower instead of a window frame of the attic, and as Clea approached, a flock of black crows flew out from there, cawing loudly. Scared, Clea took a step back. However, she decided to still inspect the inside of the structure and took out the key given by the notary. The door looked like it had been attacked with a knife and had numerous chop marks. There wasn't even a handle on the door, but Clea turned the key in the keyhole and struggled to open it. The inside of the hut was no better than the outside. The hallway was filled with all sorts of junk that Clea had to step over squeamishly to get into the living room. The three bedrooms in the house were similar to each other, with faded and horribly dirty wallpaper. Most of the furniture was broken, giving the impression that there had been a terrible fight, or the house had been ransacked. Empty bottles and shards of dishes littered the dirty floor. Clea wanted to turn around and run away from this place without looking back. However, her attention was drawn to a small door on the floor right in the middle of one of the rooms. After hesitating for a while, Clea decided to check what might be inside. Surprisingly, the wooden door yielded effortlessly, and Clea saw a staircase leading to the basement. Her imagination painted a picture of a hidden treasure in the cellar, and she felt that going downstairs might reveal some secret or mystery. However, her excitement quickly faded, as she discovered that the cellar was just as dirty and smelly as the rest of the house. It was filled with a pile of junk and rags, and nothing else. Angry and disappointed, Clea was about to leave, when she noticed a makeshift bed, made of plywood and wood. It stood in the farthest and darkest corner, which is why it hadn't caught her eye immediately. Next to the bed was a chair with a broken leg, and a nightstand with only one intact drawer. Curiosity getting the better of her, Clea approached the bed. It had a dirty mattress and a crumpled blanket, suggesting that someone had recently lived there. With a sense of disgust, she began to search through the contents of the room. Clea lifted and shook each rag, hoping to find something, although she wasn't sure what she was looking for. Suddenly, she noticed some writing on the edge of a rag like a sheet. In a note, someone had tried to communicate that they were being held against their will and asked her to call a specific phone number. Back in town, Clea immediately dialed the number. On the other end, a woman burst into tears upon recognising the reason for the call. Clea was frightened and didn't know what to do, but then a trembling male voice sounded on the receiver. "'Please tell me where this house is. I will come for you right away. Just tell me your address. My son disappeared six months ago, and it's likely that's where the kidnappers kept him.' Just an hour later, an expensive car pulled up at the gates of the orphanage, and the man who got out of it introduced himself as Mr. Neenan. During the ride, Mr. Neenan shared with Clear that his only son was his source of happiness and pride. In his thirties, he had achieved a lot and was glad to assist his father in business. But one day, Taylor didn't return from his weekly tennis practice. Mr. Neenan continued with a trembling voice. He wasn't there in the evening or the next morning. His phone was disconnected. All that was known was that he left the sports club, got into his car and headed home. After a moment of silence, Mr. Neenan took a sip of water from a bottle nearby and continued speaking. I did everything and went everywhere to find my son. I used my security service and hired detectives, but no one could find my boy. Upon arriving at Clear's house, where Taylor was held, Mr. Neenan tearfully searched every inch of the shabby dwelling, not caring about staining his expensive suit. Sitting on the cellar bed, he burst into tears and whispered, "'My boy, how have you been living here? What have those creeps done to you?' After a while, he turned to Clear and asked, "'How did you end up in this house? 
who lived here before. She briefly explained how she became the owner of the house. In the darkness, she couldn't see the man's face, but she understood that every detail was important to him. Finishing her story, she quietly added, But all that happened before Eric won this house. I don't think he knew what happened in that house. My husband Eric was too lazy to thoroughly inspect every corner of this building. He said he only came to see it once from afar. When he came to see it, if it would cover the debt of a losing card game. Upon returning to town, Mr. Neenan asked Cleo for the house documents to find out the previous owner. He immediately made a call and dictated the necessary information. In just five minutes, he received a call back, listened attentively, and thanked the person on the other end. Then, turning to Cleo, he said, Now it all makes sense to me. I know the person who is the owner of this shack very well. He is a friend of my former partner, with whom I used to do business together. My impudent partner was always jealous of me and tried to sabotage our success. After another conflict, I decided to end our business partnership, which hurt his ego. That's when my son disappeared. But all this time, I couldn't even imagine that someone I had worked with for so many years could do such a thing. Clear, thank you for not passing along my son's request for a phone call. I owe you one. If you need anything, don't hesitate to call me. He handed Clear his business card and she accepted it, saying, I wish you luck, and I'll help you in any way I can. Mr. Neenan's former business partner was quickly found, and a case was opened against him. During the trial, he proved to be a cowardly person and confessed everything during the first interrogation. It turned out that he had kept Taylor at his friend's house for several months until he lost the house in a card game. After that, he was forced to move the poor guy to another location, which he revealed immediately during the interrogation. Soon, Taylor was rescued, but his health deteriorated greatly after his imprisonment. The once athletic young man had become almost an invalid. His legs, which had been shackled for more than six months, were badly damaged, and had already begun to rot. If not treated in time, it led to sepsis. Thanks to Mr. Neenan, Clear was informed about everything that was happening. He started visiting the orphanage frequently, several times a week, to bring books, toys, and clothes for the children. At some point, Clear noticed that every time he came to the orphanage, he tried to find the director and speak with her. After the sponsor left one day, Clear approached Mrs. Kearney with a smile and said, "'Well, you predicted a rich groom for me, and it looks like you met such a one. Mr. Neenan seems to have his eye on you.' The director blushed and waved her hand dismissively, replying, "'Oh, come on, Clear, what groom? At my age? I'll spend the rest of my day with my cats, probably.' One day, Clear visited Taylor. He was admitted to the city's most expensive clinic. Mr. Neenan was willing to pay any amount to see his son recover. However, some things cannot be bought. Mr. Neenan was sitting in the hall and staring wordlessly at his smartphone. I'm very upset, Clear. Taylor's condition is not well. Time is of the essence, and they can't find enough blood for him. I can't help him. You see, Taylor is not my biological son. My wife and I deeply loved each other and wanted a big family with many children. Unfortunately, that dream never came true. That's when we decided to adopt a child from the orphanage. The moment my wife saw Taylor, she knew he was meant to be ours. By the way, Taylor doesn't know that he is adopted. Unfortunately, my wife passed away when Taylor had just started college. It was a devastating tragedy for me, but I realised I had to live for Taylor's sake. After listening, attentively, Clea softly asked, What blood type does he need? Maybe we can find a match among people we know. When she heard the answer, Clea couldn't believe her ears. The blood type was an exact match with hers. Overwhelmed with emotions, he hugged her tightly, and tears filled his eyes. You're amazing! You've saved us once again! I owe you my life! So... Clear became a blood donor for Taylor, and now all there was left to do was wait. A week later, 
Clea visited Taylor again. Suddenly, Mr. Neenan entered the room, looking somewhat bewildered, holding a white form with some data. Clea sensed that he might collapse at any moment. Without hesitation, she rushed to his aid, supporting him under his arm and helping him to sit on the armchair. She quickly poured a glass of water and handed it to him. Mr. Neenan took a few sips, expressed his gratitude and returned the glass. After a brief moment, he looked directly into Clear's eyes and said, I don't know why, but I made a DNA test. The test results have come back. You and Taylor are brother and sister. Hearing this, Clear automatically drank water in a volley from the glass she was holding at that moment. She had a brother. But how did this happen? It was beyond her comprehension. Seeing Clear's confusion, Mr. Neenan took her hand and spoke softly. We will find out the reasons, but right now we need to save Taylor. A few days later, Mr. Neenan provided answers to all Clear's questions. He hired a detective who was able to quickly uncover the truth. It turned out that Clear and Taylor's parents had tragically died in an accident when the twins were just over a year and a half old. The babies were taken in by their paternal grandmother, who later passed away from grief. Thus, at the age of almost three, they ended up in an orphanage. At that moment, Mr. Neenan and his wife came to the orphanage looking for a child, and they immediately liked Taylor. Unfortunately, the director just didn't tell them that Taylor had a sister. We would never have separated you, the man apologized. In fact, we would have happily taken both of you, but nobody informed us. Clea started to remember. In her early childhood, there was often a boy by her side, but over the years she had forgotten what he looked like. However, at times, he appeared in her dreams at night, though she never realized he was her brother. Clear was waiting impatiently for Taylor to come to his senses and gain strength, and now at last that moment had come. She rushed to him and hugged the bewildered man. Sniffling and wiping away her tears, she told him everything she had learned from Mr. Neenan. Standing at the threshold of the ward, Mr. Neenan watched them cry in each other's embrace. He had come to a decision. He would never let the sister and brother be separated again. Clear had become as dear to him as his own son. So after everyone calmed down a little, he said that now he was strongly opposed to the idea of Clear living in an orphanage. Clear, I don't mind if you continue working there. Children are always a blessing. But you can live with me and Taylor. Our house is huge. There's enough space for everyone. Plus you will be closer to your brother. However, Clear firmly refused arguing that they didn't need to live together to see each other often. She also mentioned that she had her own little house in the village, even though she knew it was impossible to live in such a dilapidated place. So, days passed after days. Clea often visited her brother in the hospital, taking care of him as if he were a baby. Sometimes she carefully fed him with a spoon. "'Why are you treating me like a baby?' he asked with a smile. I can take care of myself. Believe it or not, I learned to use a spoon and fork on my own about thirty years ago. Playfully, Clear declared, I see how independent you are now, lying here all bandaged up. Once you're on your feet, you'll have to do everything yourself. Until then, I'm sorry, but as your sister, I'll take care of you. Clear continued to work at the orphanage, dedicating herself to the children. She was ready to spend the whole day with them, only taking time off to visit her brother. Mr. Neenan kept visiting the orphanage, but now he had stopped hiding his intentions. He always arrived with a large bouquet and headed straight to the director's office. The entire staff joked that Mrs. Kearney was having an affair with a millionaire. She became ten years younger and even more beautiful than before. In confidence, she enthusiastically shared with Clea that Mr. Neenan was a very gallant and interesting man. They had gone to the theatre several times, and Mrs. Kearney returned from those outings feeling elated. Looking at the beautiful grey-haired couple, Clea wished for their happiness. 
During one of his visits to the orphanage, Mr. Neenan smiled mysteriously and said, Clea, how about taking a trip out of town? Taylor has agreed to join us, and is already in the car. I thought we could invite Mrs. Kearney to come along too. Getting some fresh air wouldn't hurt anyone. Clea sensed that he had something planned, but she didn't mind spending time with her brother, especially outdoors. The four of them merrily embarked on their journey, unaware of their destination. Yet the path seemed strangely familiar to Clea. The places appeared the same, only much had changed. Instead of a bumpy road, the car smoothly travelled on new asphalt. In what seemed like an abandoned village, there stood a beautiful modern bus stop. Clea had already imagined an old, dilapidated house, inherited from her late husband, but to her surprise, a new wooden house stood in its place. In front of the house was a perfectly manicured plot of land with a lawn and a couple of flower beds. Instead of a crooked fence, a new hedge adorned the property. Clea couldn't believe her eyes. Mr. Neenan, noticing her confusion, gently took her hand and placed the key in it, saying, "'Since you don't want to live with us, you'll have your own separate house. I hope everything is mostly taken care of, and the rest you can settle on your own.' Tears filled Clea's eyes as she stood there, afraid to take a step. Mrs. Kearney approached, hugged her by the shoulders, and whispered, "'Come on, my dear, go ahead, open the door. You deserve it, and don't forget to invite us for a visit.' Clea timidly climbed up onto the porch and inserted the key into the keyhole with a trembling hand. The broken door to the creepy hut and the rusty lock were no more. Instead, there stood a brand new door with a beautiful carved handle and a bell on her right hand. She couldn't believe what was happening. It felt like it wasn't happening to her. Or perhaps it was just all a dream. Carefully and slowly, she began to explore the house metre by metre. Everything inside was perfectly matched. The curtains, furniture, and dishes were all new. It felt as if they were bought with love. As she walked through the rooms, the mistress of the house touched everything carefully with her hands, as if trying to make sure that all of this was real. She was brought back to reality by her brother's voice. "'Well, hostess, will you at least give tea to the guests?' he asked with a smile, leaning on crutches at the entrance. Behind him, supporting Mrs. Kearney under his arm, was Mr. Neenan. By the way, I bought some groceries, he added and went to the car. They spent the day perfectly, grilling kebabs on the lawn of Clear's new house and sharing the emotions that such a surprise brought. I couldn't even imagine that it could be so beautiful here, Clear exclaimed, enthusiastically, Thank you so much, Mr. Neenan. I don't even want to leave the house. Mr. Neenan immediately looked at Mrs. Kearney and smiled. And now we're going to ask your strict director to give you a week's vacation. I think you deserve it. And as for security, your brother can stay with you. I'll provide the groceries, and you can settle in and make yourself at home. The so-called strict director, with a sweet smile, immediately replied, "'Why not? Clea is at work day and night, and here's such an opportunity. Let her have a little distraction. We'll miss her, of course, but we'll manage somehow.' Clea looked at them all, confused, and suddenly said tearfully, "'I've been without clothes for a week. I need to change. So that's impossible, probably.' But Mr. Neenan, winking at his son, replied, "'We've thought of everything.' I hope we guessed your sizes. In one of the rooms, which was made to be your bedroom, there's a closet with everything you need. Blouses, pants, tracksuits, and even pyjamas. I had to get Marianne to help me buy all sorts of feminine things. There's enough food in the kitchen for a couple of days, and then Marianne and I will come again. It was the first time he had called Mrs. Kearney by her name, and it startled her but she looked at him affectionately in reply, and he came up to her, embraced her, and added quietly, "'May I call you by name, Marianne?' The woman blushed and shyly nodded her head, 
averting her eyes. When Mr. Neenan and Marianne left, the brother and sister had been sitting on the porch for a long time, telling each other about their past lives. It was as if they couldn't talk enough, making up for all the lost years. It was well past midnight. Shivering from the chill, Clear said, "'Let's go to bed, little brother, or we'll freeze here. We'll have plenty of time to talk. By the way, you can sleep as much as you want tomorrow, because I'm going to explore the local forest.' That night, Clear slept like a log. She even woke up on the same side of the bed where she had fallen asleep, without moving an inch. When she opened her eyes and saw a ray of sunshine shining through the curtains onto the wall, the woman smiled happily. After all, it was the first time she woke up in her own home. It was difficult to believe, but it was true. Quickly getting dressed, Clea took a couple of sips of tea, and trying not to make noise so as not to wake her brother, ventured into the forest. The weather was glorious. The day promised to be hot and sunny, but it was still cool in the early morning. Dewdrops glistened on the grass. She hummed to herself and followed the path, admiring the greenery of the forest. She didn't know how long she wandered, but when she was about to return home she realised she was lost. She tried to remember where she had come from, and looked for something notable or familiar, but it was all in vain. Utterly exhausted, the woman sat down on an old stump under a large tree, and said, confusedly, "'What's the matter? I seem to be well-oriented on the terrain, and yet I got lost. I don't want to die without having lived in a new house.' At that moment a child's voice came from behind her, saying, "'Mom, don't die. You're so young and beautiful. You shouldn't. I'll take you to my daddy, and he'll save you quickly.' He saves everyone, birds, animals, and even people. My dad is a gamekeeper. Clea turned around and saw a little curly-haired creature, about six years old, who looked like an angel. The boy took her hand and led her somewhere to the side. Just then, Clea noticed that the boy was limping on one leg, and she felt sorry for him. She suggested, Why don't I carry you in my arms? You can tell me where to go. But he stopped and replied very seriously, "'You don't need to pity me. I'm already an adult. I'm used to it. I hurt my leg a long time ago when my mum was alive. I was foolish and climbed up to the attic, and that's when I hurt it. But my dad says that some day we'll have enough money to go to the city for an operation, that we don't have as much money as we need. I told him I'll grow up and help earn it. Clea was amazed at how mature the little boy was for his age, and her heart ached for Kevin, as the boy named himself. They walked for about twenty minutes, and during that time the boy never showed any signs of tiredness. When they arrived at a large, bright clearing, with a large log house in the centre, the boy shouted, "'Dad, look who I've brought! This beautiful mum was almost crying in the woods and said she was going to die!' I promised her that you would save her, and I brought her here. It was only then that Clear saw to whom he was shouting. In the far corner of the plot stood a tall young man holding an axe. He was wearing only pants and had a bare torso. Clear admired the handsome, tanned, and muscular stranger, and when their eyes met, she shyly lowered her gaze. You're right, Sonny. Such beautiful women should not die. "'the man said, putting down his axe. "'But first, we'll give her some tea, and then we'll help her.' "'Over tea, they got to know each other "'and shared a little about themselves. "'The man, named Patrick, was a widower. "'His wife had died of cancer a couple of years ago, "'and he was left with a little son in his arms. "'Unable to stay where they were happy, "'he became a gamekeeper and brought his son with him. "'Clea, in turn, shared about her not-so-happy marriage, the will, the house, and finding her brother. She was surprised at how easily she told all this to the first man she met, and found herself feeling as if she had known Patrick for many years, and didn't want to part with him at all. She arrived home in the evening to find her brother's frightened face. "'Why did you scare me so much?' he began indignantly. "'I couldn't find peace. 
You were gone all day. What if something happened to you? In reply, she smiled enigmatically and said in a mysterious voice, Something did happen to me, brother. I think I've fallen in love. He's so strong, so handsome, so extraordinary. I could listen to his voice for the rest of my life. And he has a little boy who needs medical attention. Clea recounted in detail to her brother what had happened to her in the forest. He listened attentively and responded, We must inform father about the little one. He will surely find a way to help him. But promise me, sister, that you won't frighten me like that again. I wouldn't be able to bear it if anything happened to you. Clea approached her brother and whispered while embracing him. No way! We will never get lost again. I will always be there for you, not just when you need my help. Patrick and Kevin visited Clea almost every day, bringing her blueberries or strawberries or other treats. They even met Taylor and became friends. The men had plenty of topics to talk about, and Clea was delighted to be able to see Patrick every day. And every time they came, Kevin ran to Clea, and clinging with all his little body, whispered, Clea, I miss you so much. I was sad without you. And I am without you, Clea always whispered in return, and it was true. She didn't want to part with Patrick or the boy, and she couldn't even imagine how she could go back to the city and live without them. On their day off, Mr. Neenan and Marianne came to visit with Patrick's son as a guest. They all gathered around the table, enjoying each other's company. Marianne brought delicious pies, and Clea made a tasty mushroom soup from the mushrooms Patrick and Kevin had brought. During lunch, Mr. Neenan appeared to be agitated about something. Usually cheerful, he sat there thoughtfully, occasionally stealing glances at Marianne. Finally gathering his courage, he stood up and said, "'Children, I have been contemplating and hesitating for a long time, but now I am ready. For the first time in a long time I am truly happy. I have my son with me, and now I have met a woman with whom I want to spend the rest of my life.' Taking a small box from his pocket, he turned to the astonished Marianne and continued, "'Marianne, though I may not be young any more, I want to ask you, in front of my children and our guests, to be my wife. In return, I promise to love you for the rest of my life.' There was a moment of silence. It seemed as if Mrs. Neenan would collapse if Marianne refused, but after a brief pause and wiping away a tear, she quietly replied, "'Of course, I agree. I can't imagine life without you, either.' Joyfully, he placed a ring on her finger and kissed her firmly, which made her blush and say, "'What are you doing? There are children here.' To this Kevin muttered under his breath, I'm not a child, and I've already seen men and women kissing in movies. Everyone burst into laughter, but the surprises didn't end there. After everyone finished laughing, Patrick stood up. His serious expression indicated that he had also been preparing for this moment for a long time. I didn't know how to say it, or when to say what I want to say now. The man began with concern. But since today seems to be a day of confessions, I also want to confess in front of you all that I have developed strong feelings for someone. Clea, during this week, Kevin and I have grown very fond of you, and we don't want you to leave. Kevin immediately ran up to Clea, limping and clung to her. He almost shouted, Don't go away, please. I will feel bad without you, and Daddy too. I want you to be my mum forever. Patrick, smiling sadly, said, Well, son, you beat me to it. I'd really like you to stay with us, Clea. I realise, of course, that we are still not well acquainted, but you know that Kevin and I are waiting for you eagerly. Taylor couldn't stand it any longer and cheerfully slapped himself on the knee. He exclaimed, Gee, looking at all of you, I'd like to get married myself. But there's no one to marry yet. Clear go for it. Patrick is a good man. He won't let you down. And he won't hurt you either. Clear, holding Kevin tightly and stroking his head, quietly replied, 
How can I refuse such happiness of being the mother of such a wonderful angel? A few months later, two weddings were taking place in one of the most expensive restaurants in the city. The brides wore light-colored dresses, and each had little white flowers in her hair. The grooms, dressed in strict, perfectly fitting suits, gallantly offered their hands before entering the hall. But the prettiest of all was a little light-colored boy. Dressed in a cream shirt with a suit with a bow tie, he literally glowed and didn't let go of the hand of one of the brides. Patrick jokingly whispered to Clea, "I'm even confused. Which of us is the groom, me or Kevin?" To which Clea, kissing her husband affectionately, replied, "You are equally dear to me." After the wedding, Clea moved in with Patrick permanently. Mr. Neenan found good specialists and paid for Kevin's leg operation. In a year, Kevin was pedalling a bicycle, given to him by his new grandfather. Mr. Neenan loved studying with the boy, and Kevin was happy to stay in their city house sometimes. Marianne also adored the boy and considered him her grandson, just like her husband. On one such trip, Kevin entered the kitchen where Marianne was cooking dinner. He whispered conspiratorially, "Granny, I'm about to have brothers. I overheard Mummy telling Daddy. She went to town, and when she came back, she showed some paper and told Daddy to get ready to raise two more. He hugged her and spun her around the room, almost dropping her." Eight months later, the large family gathered at the entrance of the maternity hospital. It consisted of a beautiful elderly couple. Two men with huge bouquets of flowers, and a boy, tightly holding his father's hand. Everyone rushed joyfully to the entrance, when a happy clear appeared at the door, with two babies wrapped in rose-colored blankets.